Ask not what we all be can do for you. Ask what you can do for we all be. And welcome, family, to another wonderful edutainment edition of the Artifice Presents We All Be News and Radio. I'm your host for the Empowerment segment, R2C2H3 Artifice, also known as Brother Ron. And we got some special things going on tonight. Tonight's topic, of course, is No More Secrets. The first black secret service agent, Brother Abraham Bowden, speaks out. He's also the author of The Echo from Dealey Plaza, which deals with his uh, his journey and trying to expose the cover-up involving the JFK assassination, which happened, of course, on November 22, 1963. Brother Bowden was appointed by John F. Kennedy personally to be on his White House detail, making him the first African-American Secret Service agent to be appointed to such an honor. And also he was the first black Pinkerton detective. So, I mean, Brother Abraham Bowden is also celebrating his 76th Life Affirmation Day, so it's an honor and treat to have him on to get him his due uh, on the same day, uh, commemorate his coming into this world. Without further ado, Brother Abraham Bolden, are you there? Yes, I'm doing fine, uh, Brother Ron, and thank you for the wonderful in- introduction there. Uh, it was a rough year for me, uh, 2010. I uh, had a third heart attack. I had to have a pacemaker installed and uh I had a battle with cancer, but uh, all praise be to God that uh, I came through it all fine, and it made me a stronger man because of uh, the trials and tribulations that I had to endure. Well, so I said one thing. You can't pick the, the, the cards that you dealt, but you got to play your hand very well. So it was a blessing to have you with us still in the land of the living, and also they have the honor to have you tell your tale. It truly is a blessing because a lot of people are not aware uh, still, you know, in 2010, of uh, uh, enormous contributions and sacrifice that you have made on our behalf. Yeah, and I I hope that your audience will will get quite a bit out of our conversation that we'll have tonight because uh, actually it's a serious conversation, and uh, it has to do with uh, the progress of our people, not only of black people, but also people who are citizens of America. Because what happened to me? Uh, could happen to any citizen and should not happen to the citizens of of America. And so I want to explain to your audience as much as I can and as clearly as I can the travesty of justice that I had to endure and am enduring for these past 47 years on this earth. We never will get to that, but I want to introduce another guest who's going to be listening and also hope it makes a contribution who is no stranger to injustice and overcome a lot of adversity. Sister Margaret Block, are you there? Yes, I'm here. So I thank you all forever faithful. This is a true freedom fighter extraordinaire, a civil rights movement veteran, Sister Margaret Block, out of Cleveland, Mississippi, calling, as always, to offer her insight and her wisdom. And, uh, you know, Brother Bowden, this is his 76th birthday that we're having on, so we're blessed to have this brother in Latin and living. He talked a little bit about some of the trials and tribulations he went through just recently with the heart attacks yes. and uh, the cancer and the other setbacks. Happy birthday. Yes. How you doing, Sister Margaret? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine tonight, and uh, uh, glad to meet you, and uh, I hope that we can have a spirited conversation. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Yes. Well, Brother Bowden, let's, let's start out with you. Let's start, you know, tell us about you. And, uh, so like, you know, the, the traditional stuff that people ask you, how you got involved in the Secret Service, and then things you want to offer about what went on with you. Yes, I was uh, uh, born in a small town, East St. Louis, Illinois, and uh, I grew up there, graduated from uh, Lincoln High School, went into Lincoln University, where in 1956 I graduated cum laude uh, with a degree in music. I had always uh, uh, been interested in law enforcement, though, because of the conditions that I grew up in, It was my opinion at that time that uh, I could make a better contribution in law enforcement or in law than I would make in music. So when the choice came for me to either take a a teaching job in uh, southern Missouri or to uh, go into law enforcement, I chose to go into law enforcement. And uh, I became the uh, first African-American pink and the national detective agent uh, plain clothes. Uh, they had some guards and things like that, but I became the first African-American Pinkerton agent. 
And that was no easy uh, matter either because uh, at that time in the 19, late 1950s, you know, segregation uh, was a, was just a matter of course, especially in southern Illinois. We still had the black fountains and the white fountains, and we had the black restrooms and the white restrooms. When we went to the theater, we had to sit in the balcony. So I endured all of those things that a person would endure uh, in one of the more southern uh, cities like Mississippi or anything like that. So it was the same as if I were in a, a far southern town uh, below the Delta. But uh, I wanted to make a, some contribution, and so I became a Pinkerton agent, and from there uh, I became an Illinois State policeman. And I stayed an Illinois State policeman for about four years, and on October the 30th, 1960, I became a United States Secret Service agent. Now, the way I became a Secret Service agent, I was working with um, uh, Fred Backstrom, who was special agent in charge in Springfield, and he was in Peoria uh, on the on the Kennedy T day when Kennedy was uh, was a senator. And uh, during the course of our uh, laying out the route that Kennedy was going to take as a as a young uh, senator, uh, I asked uh, SAIC Baxter, I said, do you have any Negroes in the Secret Service? And he says, uh, I don't think so, but if you're interested, he said, why don't you make out an application and take the examination and, and we'll see where it goes from there. So I took the examination, and on October the 30th of 1961, I became a United States Secret Service agent. So now, having been a private detective in the Pinkerton National Detective Agent and an Illinois state policeman, uh, one would think that the higher you go in progress in the field of police work to, and you get uh, closer uh, to the highest positions in government that things would be improving as you go along. But I found that that was not the case. I found that uh, when I went into the Secret Service, it was a very, very segregated uh, organization. Uh, they were very uh, uh, racist. Uh, not all of them. There were some who were very liberal, uh, so to speak, but uh, racism was, was uh, just an uh, main course with the uh, Secret Service. And so the president of the United States, uh, was John F. Kennedy, uh, won election uh, in that November of uh, 1960 and it became the president of the United States. Now, he came to Chicago. He was coming to Chicago to give a speech uh, thanking Mayor Daley for the the fact that uh, he won Cook County by some 8,000 votes. Now, he came to McCormick Place, and uh, the Secret Service were in charge of his protection at that time. So when they were handing out the assignments in um, the Secret Service office, I was a new agent there, and they put me uh, down in the washroom at McCormick Place. Uh, that was the lower level of McCormick Place to guard the washroom where the president was going to use uh, uh, exclusively. Now, um, that was kind of a hideaway position because the likelihood of my seeing the president or meeting the president from that position was almost slim to none. So I'm standing there uh, on April 28th, about 8.30, and um, I was kind of dejected because I, I didn't think I would get a chance to see the president. So I'm standing right there in front of the washroom, one level down from where all of the activity is going on. All of a sudden, I heard the uh, motorcade come up in front of McCormick Place, and I heard the door slamming and everything, and I looked at the top of the uh, steps and the photographer, so you could see the cameras flashing and going on. So now uh, I looked at the top of the steps, and who, who's coming down the steps except the President of the United States, John F. Kennedy. He's coming down the steps right towards me. The first thing that he wanted to do when he uh, when the motorcade stopped and got arrived at McCormick Place was use the washroom, and that <laughs> that's where I was. So as he came down the steps, he stopped and stood right in front of me, and he looked at me and he smiled, and I smiled back, and he said, "Are you a Secret Service agent? Are you one of Mayor Daly's finest?" 
I said, I'm a Secret Service agent, Mr. President. And one of the other agents who was with him told him my name. Say, he's Abraham Bowling. He's uh, stationed here in Chicago. And the president, his eyes glittering, he had such a such a wonderful smile. He looked at me with this uh, smile in his eyes, and he said, uh, Mr. Bowling, he says, uh, uh, has there ever been a Negro on the Secret Service White House detail in Washington, D.C.? I looked at him, I'd say, uh, not to my knowledge, Mr. President. And he looked around and he smiled. I, I never forget that. And he says, would you like to be the first? I said, yes, sir, Mr. President. He said, I'll be looking forward to seeing you in Washington, D.C. And I'm telling you, I was floored. I was just floored. I didn't... I didn't know what to say. We shook hands. He went into the bathroom, and uh, he was with uh, Mayor Daly of the city of Chicago. All of the dignitaries were following the president, and I had a chance to meet and shake hands with Congressman Dawson and some, just some of the most influential Chicago politicians that, that were there. So by the Secret Service putting me downstairs in the washroom, uh, they uh, put me in the position to meet people that I never would <laughs> have met in this lifetime. So uh, it was a very, very enlightening experience uh, for me, and I was deeply indebted to the president for selecting me to become the first African-American uh, Secret Service agent on the White House detail. So you seem like a person there. I mean, you're a very hardworking person, and it seemed like you did everything by the book. And uh, but you know some some different changes in the environment you was put in on the White House detail. Like yes, you know, you yes, I did. Yes, I did. Right, right away, I I could tell that uh, they had an old boys club there. They they really didn't like me uh, coming in and 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 breaking up. They uh, they thought that uh, maybe I was a misfit simply because of my race. You know, they they had things going pretty much like they wanted it. And uh, when I got there, uh, I was um, uh, insulted a couple of times while I was with uh, the president. As a matter of fact, my supervisor, when we went to Hannesport, Massachusetts, I had a supervisor. His name was Harvey Henderson. And um, uh, on the Kennedy compound, while we were uh, relaxing there at the hotel one uh, one afternoon, he told me to my face. He says, uh, Bolden, and I said, yeah, what, Harvey? And he looked me right in the eye, and he was drinking a beer. Of course, he was uh, half uh, inebriated. He said that um, uh, you're a nigger. You were born a nigger. You're going to die a nigger, and that you will never be anything but a nigger. So act like one. Now, this came from a Secret Service supervisor who was guarding and surrounding the president. And I noticed when we were in Hyannisport and when we were in transit uh, on the uh, press plane flying to Hyannisport that uh, these agents were drinking. And these were the same agents who once at the plane landed at Otis Air Force Base were going to be surrounding and guarding the president. And uh, many of them were getting high. They were drinking on the press plane. And when the plane landed, they they were clearly in no condition to protect the president of the United States. And so I could see many of the rumors that had been circulating concerning the Secret Service and the conditions that the agents uh, were in uh, during their assignments uh, at many times uh, was true. I had heard those rumors as an agent in Chicago, and I, I uh saw that they were actually true. Now, while we were in uh, in Hyannisport, Massachusetts, the president kind of looked out for me uh, because he could see that there was a, a strange relationship between me and some of the other agents, and I think that he well realized why. And he saw to it himself, for, the, for instance, that uh, I received some of the benefits that were being uh, denied me. For instance, uh, when he went yacht riding one day, uh, normally my supervisor, the same one who told me uh, who I was, uh, would put me on a follow-up boat, which would be behind the yacht as we would go up and down the ocean at Nantucket Sound, uh, that uh, follow-up boat uh, would be doing uh, 
about 40, 50 miles an hour, and the water would be splashing in your face and things like that. And and it was not a very comfortable assignment, especially when you're wearing a suit and a tie. Now, uh, the president noticed that the three days we went out there that I was on a follow-up boat. So the fourth day, um, the president called my supervisor over, and they had a conversation. And uh, my supervisor came back and told me that I would be I was assigned to the yacht. Of course, I knew who the uh, from whom that came. That came from the president of the United States himself. And so um, I was on the yacht and sitting in the big leather chair and uh, watching Jackie and the, and the president as as they were uh, relaxing. And uh, all of a sudden, the cabin door opened and. Uh, there was a Navy uh, man dressed. He was really dressed. Those uh, creases were in his clothes and everything. Shoes looked like glass. And uh, he had a tray in his hand. And he came to me, and uh, he set the tray down, and he said, the president would like for you to have lunch. <laughs> oh, man, I, I tell you, this was just too good to be true, that uh, here, here I am, uh, uh, the subject of the attention of the President of the United States. But uh, I could tell that um, that what he was trying to do was let me know very much that I was very welcome to be on the detail and that if I wanted to make that uh, a lifetime assignment, that uh, I would be welcome to do so. So also you, uh, you stated in the book that you had interest in becoming an African ambassador. and that Kennedy Yes, I did. Up with that. Yes, I had a conversation with President Kennedy uh, and Bobby Kennedy, as a matter of fact, because Bobby Kennedy asked me why didn't I come into the FBI. And uh, I, I told him I didn't have a law degree. And during that uh, conversation that I had with the president and, and his brother, the president asked me if I wanted to make a career out of uh, being a Secret Service agent. And I told him, well, I would like to uh, have been an ambassador to one of the African countries. And uh, he asked me if I spoke any African language. I told him, no, I didn't. And he said, well, you uh, try to enroll at Burleigh School of Languages in Chicago and uh, let me know uh, when you finish, you take one of the languages, and I'll see that you uh, meet one of your goals. And I really appreciated that. We shook hands, and I think that if he had lived... Uh, I probably would have uh, gone on to be an ambassador. He was he was really for me. Let me just tell you this, is that he was uh, a remarkable man. Mm -hmm. President Kennedy was a remarkable man. I was in the White House, and uh, he didn't know I was there yet, and the uh, cabinet meeting was breaking up. And uh, Hubert Humphrey and Barry Goldwater came out of the Oval Office. They used the Oval Office door to come out. Well, they left it somewhat open. And I reached in to close the door, and the president looked up and saw me. And uh, he uh, waved. He said, Mr. Bolden, he says, I see that you made it. And I was very impressed that he is a president of the United States, remembered my name. He called me Miss, Mr. Mm -hmm. Bolden, and, and I was just shocked. And he commenced to take me around, introduce me to Evelyn Lincoln and uh, some of his staff, and uh, Andrew Hatcher, who was the first African-American deputy press secretary in the White House. And when he came to Pierre Solinger, he says, Pierre, come over. I, I want to introduce you to somebody. And uh, Pierre came over. Pierre was a, a, a great uh, baseball fan, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. And uh, the president looked at him and saying, he looked at me and said, I want you to meet Mr. Abraham Bowden. and say, he's the Jackie Robinson of the Secret Service. And I almost... And I just, I just couldn't believe it. And he, he equated me with such an icon like Jackie Robinson. So it, it, it was great. It was great. But uh, I was not satisfied with uh, what was going on among the agents in the, in the detail. And uh, I made it a point before I left the uh, Washington D.C. I asked to be relieved of, of the detail. But before I left Washington, D.C., I went into the chief of the Secret Service office, Chief U.E. Bauman, 
Mm-hmm. And I told the chief that if an assassination attempt were made on the president, it would be successful. And I explained to him why it would be successful, that there were a few other agents around him. I had heard them in conversation with each other, and they were saying to each other, if a person tried to assassinate the president, I wouldn't protect him because of his stand for civil rights in the South. Oh, there wow. were some, yeah, very deep. That that was very deep because I'm looking at it like this. We're not there specifically uh, to uh, protect just the president of the United States, John F. Kennedy. We were there as co- commitment. We were upholding the Constitution of the United States of America, of which the president is the chief executive. See, and and that's where they were losing focus. They began to protect the man instead of the principle of the democracy upon which this country was built. And that was the danger because uh, when you get into these prejudice things and like that, it influences your activity and it influences your ability to react and do what is called upon you in case of an emergency. Oh, wow. I mean, it's like it came to fruition what you said because, uh, you know, I was thinking to myself when they, you said about the Jackie Robinson thing, and then all of a sudden you became Pete Rose. You know, he yeah. was a, a person that was tired and feathered uh, for not any, any reason besides the fact that you try to uh, do right and you saw wrong, you try to write it, and you was a person, like you said, you was about the protocol, you were very professional. And also I want to talk about, like, uh, working outside the White House detail, like you're working back in Chicago. You, you're working out the U.S. Treasury Department, correct? Yes, that, that's right. I was working in the U.S. Treasury Department. As a matter of fact, I had uh, 100% uh, uh, solutions to my counterfeiting cases that, that I handled. Well, that led up to, um, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I was considered one of the top agents, and uh, Mr. John Hanley, uh, who had been the special agent in charge in the Chicago office was considering uh, me for for putting me in an office. I understood somewhere up around Nevada, somewhere giving me a, a district of my own. He had discussed that with me, so I, I was doing very very well until um, Mr. Maurice G. Martin uh, was transferred to Chicago in 1963. And me and Mr. Martineau, who was an uh, assistant special agent in charge, did not like Mr. Hanley. They had uh, something uh, between them, and they put me in the middle because I was uh, uh, very, very uh, friendly with uh, Mr. Hanley, but I couldn't get along at all with Mr. Martineau. So in uh, 1964, early 1964, <laughs> Mr. Martinoy, as chances would have it, uh, became the special agent in charge of the office. And I, I knew, knew then that my days were numbered because uh, man, he he really disliked me. And also, I mean, like you said, you had like 100%, you saw 100% of your cases, correct? Yeah, that's right. So you were basically like the top, well, I get from a book, you're like the Michael Jordan of uh, Secret Service agents, to put it like Oh, yes, yes. I was like Muhammad Ali. Oh yeah, you really, you really you took your job seriously. But then, it had you classing with your superiors in at your job at the top with some of your superiors. Yes, they they hated that fact because uh, uh, I could almost predict they would uh, find me a counterfeiting case, and I I, I never failed to find the uh, plant, uh, the print, the eat ink, the press, and everything. I would I would solve the case right down to. To uh, it, its uh, limits, uh, everything, the paper, the printer, and uh, uh, there was a little bit of jealousy, you know, and uh, I was called in one time uh, and told by uh, Mr. Martin and say, you, you're solving all of these cases. He says, why don't you turn some of these cases over to some of these other agents who are not doing so good? Well, I tell you, uh, my brother, uh, some of those agents would be sitting around with their feet on the desk, and on cold days they wouldn't go out. When it was snowing, they wouldn't go out. And I would be out there trudging and, and working hard and diligently, and uh, I'm not trying to say I was better than any other agent or anything like that, right. but uh, I was just trying to do the best job that I could. 
That's all. And, uh, you know, they called it, they have a name for it. They say, you brown nose, you know, you're trying to show us up, but that was not my that was not not my purpose at all. I was just doing the best job that I could for the United States and for the charge that had been given me by the Treasury Department. And also, you was immune from racism, uh, you know, at that job as well. I mean, you had a noose put up over your desk. Right? Yes, that that's right. I came in one morning. One morning, I came in to work and. Uh, I happened to rear back, I answered the telephone, and I look up, and here's this rope hanging down, tied in in the form of a noose. And, uh, uh, of course, I understood what that means because the the racial uh, climate at that time was very heated. And uh, so when Mr. Martinell came into the office, I told him about it. And he says, oh, that's, they're just having fun. It's just somebody having fun with you. But that was a serious sign back in the in the sixties, in nineteen sixty two and sixty three, because our people were actually getting lynched. They were actually mm-hmm. being murdered and torn apart by dogs and shot by rifles and things like that. So it was no joking matter to me. And I can't see it was a funny sense of humor for somebody to put uh, something like that over my desk. So he sent down and, and had one of the janitors to bring the ladder up there and, and remove it. They never did find out uh, uh, who did it or anything like that. Well, also, I mean, like, this is crazy because on a, on a repeating theme in the book is telling people telling you that they never had to walk a mile or an inch in your shoes. Oh, just get over it. You had folks calling you nigger to your face, making nigger jokes, uh, you know, just totally just disrespecting you. On a yes, day-to-day but, basis, and your superior is supposed to have your back, especially somebody of your type of exceptional skill and ability of a job, was kept on getting told, you got to get over it. You're, you're too thin-skinned. Yes, that's what they told me. They called me thin-skinned because I objected to many of the, the racial jokes that they uh, made. It, they didn't only make them about uh, so-called Negroes back in there. They were talking about Jews uh, also in uh I took exception to that because I thought that uh, any type of racial uh, jokes were uh, simply out of place in that setting like that because we're supposed to be representing the United States government. We're supposed to be uh, on a higher level than those uh, who are less fortunate or less educated than we, than, than, uh, we were. And so we're supposed to set an example, not fall to the level of the racist and the, the, the so-called red, rednecks. It was also like, I, what I like about your book is like it has so many things working for it. I like the supernatural, uh, supernatural, excuse me, or spiritual element of the book. Yeah. Where you, were, you told that you thought your life was going to end by the time you turned 30. Yeah, and, that's uh, right. And in the beginning of November of 63, I mean, you were 29 at the time, correct? Yes, that's right. Then when everything started taking a turn for the worst, correct? Yes, it did. It turned for the worse. It absolutely turned for the worse because after the president was assassinated, I was a uh, agent in Chicago here on the day that he was assassinated. I was out investigating a, a check forgery case, and uh, I was standing in a, in a nightclub, a tavern down on 37th and in Indiana here in Chicago, and it came over the television that uh, the president had been shot. Well, I knew right away that uh, that the ball game was over because, uh, as I had predicted, uh, that the president would be killed if an assassin would make the effort. So I raced back to the office uh, just in time to find out that the president had, uh, in fact, died. And from that time on, I, I witnessed myself, and I'm telling uh, your audience the truth, the very truth. I saw them hiding certain documents. They were shipping certain documents out. We were called in and told not to discuss uh, some of the investigations that we were making in connection with other groups who were out to assassinate the president of the United States. For instance, we had in uh, early November, we had a report that there were uh, there were uh, two uh, Europeans and uh, two Cubans, or uh, Latin American ac- abstract, who were uh, 
had in their room four rifles with telescopic sights. And that, that was marked on that. Now, the president was supposed to be coming into Chicago on November the 2nd for an Army Navy football game. And uh, these um, uh, assassins, uh, uh, suspected assassins, had rented a, uh, a room along the route to where the president was supposed to go down, sort of like in Dallas, Texas, past some of the tallest buildings there in Chicago. So now uh, the Secret Service must that investigation, and I saw that investigation deep six. Uh, they destroyed the investigation and told us that the agents who were there that that investigation never existed, not to talk about it, and to turn in all of the papers and documents concerning that investigation. Now we had a person who was actually arrested during that particular time around November the 1st, uh, his name was Arthur Valley. He was found with dynamite in the back of his car, you know, a, a rifle with a telescopic sights. And the uh, the information was that he was here in Chicago to uh, assassinate the president. He was an ex-Marine, and uh, he also had a background similar to Oswald. Uh, now, Valley uh, uh, alleged that he had at one time worked for the uh, CIA. He was arrested here in Chicago uh, for a uh, dirty license plate or a light out or something like that with the cooperation of the Chicago Police Department. And, and during that search, that's when they found these weapons and explosives in the, in the trunk of his car. Now, uh, Strangely enough, uh, Valley was not prosecuted for threatening the president. As a matter of fact, he was only prosecuted for the misdemeanor uh, of, a, of a carrying a, a weapon and a dirty license plate or a light out or whatever the charge was, and he, he was released. And uh, the thing about it, that was very strange to me. We had another case where uh, shortly before the president was assassinated, we had a, a man named Eshavir said that uh, the president is about to be assassinated. He said that he said that to one of the uh, informants in the United uh, of the United States Secret Service informant that the president was about to be assassinated, and there was a big investigation going on about that case. Now, after the president was assassinated, I saw the supervisor. So, uh, collected all of the reports that had been dictated uh, about that case before the president was assassinated. He took all of those reports, and they were banded up in his office, and those reports were redictated to indicate that the investigation took place after the president was assassinated. Now, I'm, I'm seeing this, and, and, and that, that worried me, you know, because after all, I had put my hand on the Bible, and I had sworn uh, to uphold the Constitution of the United States from all enemies, both foreign and domestic. So I, I saw some things there that, that didn't quite jive with uh, what I had learned the Constitution was all about and how agents should uh, react in, in, in the performance of their duty. In other words, I saw a cover-up in progress. Yeah, it, it was a cover. It was no question in my mind that something was being covered up. And now, so, in in fact, it, it occurred to me that it seems as if that the Secret Service were more interested in zeroing in on Oswald as being the long, the long shooter and uh, uh, putting aside all of the other evidence of any other conspiracies. And I thought that uh, that the uh, Warren Commission, who was investigating the case at that time, should be notified that these things were going on. Well, when I went to Washington, D.C. on May the 17th, uh, I tried to make a phone call to the White House in order to find out J. Lee Rankin, who was the counsel for the Warren Commission. I wanted to find out... Uh, if I could make a meeting with him and go over some things and appear before the Warren Commission. Mm -hmm. But when I went and made a telephone call in a telephone booth, 
the, it was a tandem telephone booth. And I was with another agent. The other agent went into the telephone booth next to mine. Now, some of your younger listeners may not may not uh, understand when I said telephone booth, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was a long time ago. They had these little boxes on the corner where you would go in there and close the door and make your telephone calls. You would put a dime in there. So they don't know what I'm talking about, but... But the the agent went into the booth next to mine, and I never heard his dime fall. And that's where they came from, dropping a dime on somebody. But it, but anyway, I never heard his coin go through. It would make a ding ding sound when you put your money in there. Right. And so I knew that uh, his purpose in going into the telephone booth next to mine was to try to overhear my conversation and what I was doing. And so I bought it to call. And uh, the next morning, uh, uh, which was May the 18th of uh, 1964, uh, the personnel director, Mr. Anderson, came to me with a smile on his face, said that they needed me back in Chicago. We need you back in Chicago to, for an investigation of a counterfeiting ring. And uh so uh, they put me on a plane, brought me back to Chicago, and I was with uh, Inspector McCann. And uh, when we arrived at Chicago, uh, they took me to the office of the United States Attorney, which which was not out of the way because I had been through those things before. I right. actually, you you know, it, it, this was uh, par for the course, you might say, you, when they're briefing you or debriefing you, want you to uh, take on an assignment. They said that the informant was in in the uh, Secret Service office, and they were telling him what they wanted him to do. Well, after I had been there, sitting in that room, it was 98, 99 degrees in in that room. It was hot, man. Yeah. And I'm waiting for uh, the, the, to get the assignment. In walks Mr. Martin now and said, they're uh, uh, charging me with attempted bribery. And I almost hit the floor. Well, I said, no, you, you, you know, I didn't know if they were serious or whether this this was a part of the investigation or just what. And and, and I'm, I'm wondering, and I told him, I said, that, that's ridiculous. And uh, he says, well, you prove it. Well, you, you can't prove that you did do something. Now, let me just run this, let me just run this by you. The person who they had making the charge against me was a guy named Frank Jones, Frank William Jones, a career criminal. Mm -hmm. This man, since the age of 29, had been in prison some four times. He had been convicted of two felonies already, and he was on his way to jail because I arrested him twice for counterfeiting uh, uh, money, and that would have been the third felony conviction for him which mean that he never would have got out, gotten out of the penitentiary. So what they did, they dropped his case. They freed him and had him to testify against me. Oh. Now, he, he, he is a man who, at the very time that he testified against me, had a case against him in state court. For going around, he was collecting money in the name of one of the aldermen, here alderman Charles Chu. He was going to people saying the alderman sent him to collect money for the campaign, and he was converting that money to his own use. This guy, Frank Jones, he had a case on him in state court. Now, this is the type of person that that they used to say that I sent him now, this is a man that I arrested twice and had a case pending on to another counterfeiter named Joseph Spagnoli in order to sell a government file for $50,000. Now, they took me to trial on that. Now, let me just, just tell you, because this is where it gets really uh, interesting, because our Constitution uh, has written within it certain guarantees. None of those guarantees were afforded to me, and, and that is the basis of, of my major complaint, is the fact that 
When I was brought back to Chicago, I requested an attorney. They denied that. Mm-hmm. I requested food. They denied that. They wouldn't let me talk with anyone. All right. Now, when I went to trial, the judge, during the deliberation of the jury, brought the jury out of the jury room. This is after all the testimony had been taken, brought the jury out of the jury room and told the jury this, that in my opinion, the evidence sustains a verdict of guilty. Then he sent the jury back in the jury room with the uh, admonishment that now go back and deliberate using the instructions that I just gave you. So he actually became a juror. Now, that was as unconstitutional as anything could get. Mm -hmm. And... uh, but that jury uh, was a hung jury. There was a sister on the jury who didn't go along with what the judge did, and she thought with all her heart, soul, and mind, her name was Anna B. Hightower, that I was not guilty, which I wasn't. Right. And uh, she thought about it so uh, so heavily that she went to the press. She went to uh, Channel 7 here in Chicago and complained that they were railroading me. And there was absolutely no evidence that I had done anything but tried to do my job. All right. Now, so I had a second trial. This same judge uh, would not remove himself from a second trial and heard a second trial. This same judge, J. Sam Perry, after he had told the first jury that he thought that I was guilty. Now, as the second trial, as the jury is uh, deliberating, the judge puts my attorney, me, and all of the spectators out of the court building and locks the doors. He has the attorney to take a, and locks the doors, saying that the jury was finished for deliberating for the night and that uh, he was going home and uh, the jury would start deliberating in the, next, the, the next morning. Now, on my way driving home, I hear a special bulletin on WBBM radio that said the jury just reached a verdict, and it will be read tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. So here we have a, a case where the defendant was locked out of the courtroom, out of the court building. The, the, the door was chained so we couldn't get back in. The only people who were inside that building at the time that the jury would continue to deliberate was the judge who had already said that he thought I was guilty, a few FBI agents, Secret Service agents, and the U.S. Attorney's Office, and the jury. So, And the jury just happened to be, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, an all-white jury. That, that's what I was tried before. And they were allegedly a juror of my peers. Mm-hmm. So as you can see, I, I didn't have a chance. But I, I knew what it was all about. I knew what it was all about, and they were trying to silence me, and they feared that some of the things that I had uh, said and believed uh, may may become uh, widespread, uh, which they eventually did, because rather than just let them railroad me without really giving the public my, the reason that I thought I was being railroaded, uh, I came out to the newspapers and I defended myself and told the public exactly what I thought this thing was all about. Well, when I did that, I knew that uh, that they weren't going to stop with just a conviction. They sentenced me to six years, and I, I figured that uh, I had to make a judgment call. I said that uh, now... I'm not really dealing with uh, democratic government here. I'm dealing with something that's that's, that's fascist, that that's uh, not quite uh, in accordance with the Constitution of the United States. So I have to protect myself. Right. And I knew that the next thing that they would do, uh, short of killing me, would be to tamper with my mind. They would try to uh, 
declare me insane so that uh, the conversation that we're having right now today couldn't take place because if I had ever been declared insane, you wouldn't be talking to me today because I that would be all part of my record and I would be uh, tagged as unbelievable for the rest of my life because I had been treated for insanity. Now, uh, so they put me in Springfield after I had been in Fort Leavenworth and in wow. Terry Hutt uh, Federal Penitentiary. They transferred me to a Springfield prison farm. Now, I knew the reputation of uh, Springfield. So prior to me being incarcerated, I hired an attorney surreptitiously in Springfield. His name was John Hausmer because I anticipated that that's what the uh, government was going to do. It was going to send me to a place, try to declare me insane, so that I would never be able to testify or to say anything again with any type of credibility. And so that's what I did. And sure enough, uh, while I was in uh, Springfield, Missouri, in the, in the prison camp there, uh, one of the inmates who was a, a patient, he was a, a a mental patient there. I worked with him in the kitchen. Mm-hmm. He drew a, a 12-inch butcher knife on me saying that uh, I had taken his mop bucket. Now, th- this is about a mop bucket. Right. Well, this guy is being there treated uh, for insanity. Now, I knew when they assigned him there that when he was in Lompoc in Arizona in one of the federal prisons there, that all of a sudden, for no reason at all, he had taken a baseball bat and had beaten um, an African-American half to death with the baseball bat just all of a sudden for for no reason at all. He just went off, and that's why he was there at Springfield. Well, he came after me with a 12-inch butcher knife, and I had a bucket of hot water, ball and hot water. I was working in the officer's kitchen. And uh, he threatened me with the knife, and I told him if he take one step uh, closer, I was going to take all the skin off with that uh, bucket of ball and hot water. I was the dishwasher there in the officer's kitchen. Well, that was a setup also, because what happened, they sent him back uh, to to where he uh, was housed, which was in 2-1 East, and they sent me back to the camp. All right, they they tried to say that I was trying to discipline him, and that was beyond my authority to try to discipline a patient at the institution. And the uh, chief of classification and parole went so far as to uh, have told me, you should have taken that knife from him, you being an FBI agent, uh, ex-FBI agent. You know how to defend yourself. You know how to take knives from people. That's what you should have done. And I thought that was rather ridiculous. I, I'm, I was an inmate just like him, not an FBI agent. And he, and so they accused me of, uh, you might say, is, is trying to uh, run the place, so to speak. And on the uh, July the 6th, uh, 1967, my worst fears came uh, came to be. Now, Springfield is a three-way institution. They have a farm there. They have a hospital there for people who need operations for diabetics and just just routine medical uh, problems. And they also have the psychiatric unit. It's 2-1 East. All of the people there, the inmates there, call it the tomb. And that's what they call it. Nobody wants to go to the tomb because once they get you in there, you just don't come out. They wreck your mind. They fill you with these uh, narcotic drugs and thorazine, and they just the inmates there, they just turn them into just animals, you might as well say, people who can't think, uh, can't, can't hardly eat. They're so full of these drugs. So mm-hmm. at 3 o'clock in the morning, on uh, July the 6th, uh, 1967, two guards came to my uh, bed, and this was shortly after I had had that confrontation with this uh, this uh, inmate. Two guards came, and they poked me and woke me up and told me to follow them. And we began to walk 
<clears throat> in the in in the middle of the night down those uh, long hallways, and uh, I'm following these guards. I I don't know at the time where where we're going. Uh, yeah. Because they transfer you the same way they come get you. They transfer you to another institution. You don't have any rights or anything. So we keep walking and keep walking. And all of a sudden, we come to this massive steel door. I didn't even know where 21 East was. Come to this massive steel door, and they open the door. And just the scent would knock you down. And the guard came. And uh, I knew then when I heard the screaming and yelling and the cursing, the foul language, I knew where I was and I knew what I was up against. And I just became, you might say, weak with fear because I knew this was, uh, I knew what they were trying to do. So, they uh, took my clothing, stripped me naked, and put me in in one of the cells. And and uh, it, it 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 was pretty hard. Uh, I thought about my family. I had such a wonderful family. I thought about my. Wife Barbara had mm. been so much for me. My son Dame and Abram and I I just knew I just had to make it some kind of way. And here I am naked and uh, the next day four guards come to the door and they unlock the door and say medication time. I say, I'm not on medication. They say, you are now. I say, who said so? They said, Dr. Kinsel. I say, I'm not a mental patient. They said, well, you're going to take the medication. I say, I'm going to refuse to take it. You need a court order to give me the medication. He said, oh, you're going to take it, boy. Just like that. I say, you're going to either take it in this tablet form or we're going to give it to you in your ASS. So I didn't have much choice. I tried to outslick them and put the tablet under my tongue, but they were hip to that. I wasn't the first one that uh, thought of that. They made me raise my tongue and uh, made sure that that I swallowed it. Oh. And I knew that they were putting me on the on the road to no return. Now inmates call this place the tomb, and they call it uh, rightfully because most of the men who went in there never came out. They, you, you're in there for life because once that they get you in there and they change your status, if they're, you have to get a court order to come out of there. And they keep you in there for the rest of your life. They can until you're certified sane. So during six years in the penitentiary, I could have been there for 25, 30, 40 years. I could still be there trying to do six years because I'm not a prisoner. I'm a patient, you see. That's uh, that's a loophole where they try to keep you for the rest of your life. I knew they had that in store for me. But I tell you, Brother Ron and Mm -hmm. Sister Margaret, I grew up believing in the justice of God. And I had one thing to fight with, and that was the truth, and that was God, the love of God. And I did a lot of praying uh, while I was in there. There was nobody that could fight for me. There was nobody could raise a hand for me. As a matter of fact, the reason that they come get you at 3 o'clock in the morning is so that the other inmates won't even know where you are. You oh. just disappear. They don't know whether you at another institution, been transferred, or they, they don't have any idea where you are. 
And the next time they would, the uh, other inmates see you, you would be just helpless as you could be. I saw men walking like that, like zombies. And at night I was I was listening to the inmates there who would be hollering, throwing feces up against the door and things like that, mm-hmm. completely driven out of their mind hollering and screaming to the top of their voice, trying to get at the guards, beating their heads up against that steel door in the glass. All of these things were going on around me. And I had to figure out a way uh, to avoid them uh, doing what they were doing to me. So I was laying on my bunk one night, brother, Mm-hmm. And uh, I had almost given up hope. And I saw this light that came on on the right side of my bunk, uh, up in the corner, in the ceiling. And as I watched this light, it grew in intensity, and it became very, very white. I wouldn't lie to you, brother and sister. This actually happened. Mm. And uh, I laid there. And as the light dimmed some, the picture of a face came very clear inside that light. And I'm laying there. I could think. I'm laying there. I said, am I hallucinating? Am I going crazy? Am I going nuts? Have these people been a success in driving me out of my mind? I was thinking all of these things as I watched that light. And then a voice emanated from that light, a voice that I had never heard before. And it was such a mellow voice. It was it, it, was, it was like water roaring. And, and when it spoke, it, was, it, it just made your whole insides vibrate. It was smooth, no cracking. And it asked me my name, and I told him my name. And the voice told me, said, God is with you. And you know, as the light died away, I got up and I sat on the side of my bunk. And I was thinking, have they gotten to you or have you gone mad? And then I heard the footsteps of the guards rushing towards my room, the cell that I was in. So I laid back on the bunk right quick and fold my arms across my chest like I was asleep. And they stopped right in front of my door. And they took this big five-cell five flashlight and they shone it all around the room. They all up in the ceiling and they raked it across me a few times and they shined it all around the room. So I'm laying there thinking I'm playing sleep. And then finally they were uh, mumbling something to each other. I couldn't hear them because of the big steel door I was behind. But they were talking to each other. Then they cut off the light, and then they went back downstairs. And I said to myself, they heard something too. I'm not nuts. Oh. I'm not nuts. They they heard. They, they saw something. I heard something because... Uh, uh, they they just came to my cell. They didn't go to anybody else's cell but mine, and then they went back to where where they were uh, uh, seated. The next morning, a miracle happened there. I heard the bells ringing. I didn't know what it meant. There was bells were ringing, ding, 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 ding. So I went to this little window, what was in my steel door, and I started looking as far as I could see up and down the aisle, and I I could smell smoke. I had been locked up in there for 10 days, and they had been trying to give me this medication. And I heard one guard say to another, what's going on? And said, there's a fire. So there's a fire in the cell next to next to Bolton. And the other guard hollered back and says, nobody in that cell. It can't be. And he said, well, the whole cell is on fire. It's burning. The whole room is on fire. 
And so they had to let me out. They brought me out of there. And I'm telling you, it wasn't one second too soon. So when they brought me out of there and I had a chance to sit with those other inmates who were there, I happened to see one inmate who was there in 2 one East that I witnessed killed another inmate on the elevator. And he came and sat down next to me. He was all drugged up and doped up. And and I told him I, I didn't witness uh, what happened, but uh, I was uh, in the uh, officer's kitchen. I was assigned there in what happened was that I was on the elevator taking a uh, uh, tray of potatoes up to the main kitchen, and uh, when the elevator door opened, when I went back downstairs, this guy, James Robinson, rushed on the elevator with a shank that he made. Mm-hmm. There was another young man standing behind me, and he commenced to uh, cut this man's guts out with his shank. Yeah, I thought he was coming after me. Mm-hmm. Be, be, by me being an agent, you know. So I stepped to the side, and I tried to put that cart between me and him, but he went right past me, and he stabbed this other young man to death. Blood was squirting everywhere. And uh, this is the uh, person that came and sat down next to me. Of course, I told him I didn't see anything. <laughs> no, I didn't see anything. But uh, but uh, I can laugh a little bit about it now. But I'm right. telling you, it wasn't funny then. <laughs> so finally, they transferred me out of there. Now, let me uh, tell you this, and then uh, your guests can ask me. Uh, so I mean, your audience can ask me any question that they want to. They decided that. They were going to try to change my um, number, my camp number, to a P number and keep me in psychiatric. I knew that's what they wanted to do. And the whole instigator behind this was the chief of the classification and parole. And uh, his name was Julius Nichols. Mm -hmm. He was the chief of classification and parole. He's the guy that said that I should have taken the knife away from this uh, maniac there who was threatening me. Right. Yeah. And so now I get wind that uh, I'm on the list to go before a committee that Friday for 30 days. That would have been my 30th day there. On my 28th day, I had a, a vision, sort of like the first vision. The only thing about this second vision was that uh, no words were spoken. But as the light dimmed, there was the image of a man hanging by his neck. And clearly, I could see the image of a man hanging by his neck. And again, and again, I thought maybe that I I was losing it, you know. And the same reaction from the guards happened again. This happened early in the morning. I heard them running. They were actually running up those steel steps and came to my room and they were shining a light all around. Then one of them took the key, opened the door, and looked in and closed the door back. So I said, well, that wasn't a hallucination either. Now, I'm supposed to go to before the committee. The committee consists of the warden and their nurses and doctors and psychiatrists and things, and they do that in order to change your your status at the institution. If they had been able to change my status, I would, uh, as I said earlier, I, I could, they could have held me forever. There would have been nothing that I could do. So after I had this vision, I discussed it with one of the inmates uh, who was there, who I had uh, be- befriended. And it got back to the psychiatrist. And the psychiatrist came to my, uh, the next day he came and he said, uh, to me that uh, this was why you're here. You're having these illusions and things, uh, and, and that's why we, we're going to treat you. We're going to have a hearing tomorrow, and uh, we're going to see if we can treat you and get you well again. Well, Julius Nicholas, chief classification of parole, is the person who must sign the document 
to change my status at the institution. It must bear his signature before it can go to Washington, D.C., because he was the chief of classification and parole, and no change of classification can be made without his okay, not even by the warden. Well, that Friday morning, they came and got me around 9 o'clock and took me into this big conference room, which was uh, located near the psychiatric ward, and I sat down. And without too much uh, talking, the associate warden told me to get my things and go back to the camp. And I was really shocked. I said, hey, this is supposed to be an insanity hearing that they're going to put me through to change right. my number. So now I look around, and I don't see Mr. Nicholas, Julius Nicholas, anywhere. And he's the guy that's supposed to sign the commitment paper. So I go back to the camp, and I see my friend Gus Postel. He said, man, are we happy to see you. We heard that you were going to the committee today. I said, I did go. I said, but Mr. Nicholas didn't show up. He said, Mr. Nicholas? He said, man, Mr. Nicholas is dead. I said, dead? So yeah, wow. he hung himself last night. Oh. I said, what? So he hung himself, Jeff, and he would, uh, Gus ran downstairs, got the newspaper, and showed it to me on the front page. What had happened, Mr. Nicholas went home, got in an argument with his wife. I don't know what the argument was about. Shot her in the leg, chased her down the street. Mm-hmm. Uh, went uh, When uh, she ran in the neighbor's house, he ran back uh, to his house a couple of doors down. Ran in the house and locked the doors, went down in the basement and threw a rope over the uh, furnace uh, pipes down there and stood on the box, jumped off, and hung himself. So there was no way that day that they could have any hearing uh, on my insanity. So they had to release me and send me back to camp. Oh, wow. Yeah, he, he, he was removed by God. God moved him, You yeah. you see. Because I firmly believe, brother, that there are other works that I have to do. And uh, I, I'm, I'm about doing those works now. Now, we, uh, your audience, if they want to ask questions, that's fine. Oh, yeah. I have, uh, we have a lot of questions. There's phone line. Uh, there's people on the phone line right now. But I want to uh, just shoot in some, some points. You did a great job. I got to read the book, The uh, Echo from Daily Plaza, his memoirs. It's so powerful. It's very impactful. Uh, Brother Bolden is very humble, but man, he's a true spiritual warrior. He, like Sister said on our chat room, he helps us a strong constitution. Uh, Sister Elizabeth Warren wishes you a happy birthday from the chat Thank room. You. And she's been researching this for several years now. But I want to tell people these things that uh, Mr. Bolden is pulling out. Uh, number one, over 300 people have died under mysterious circumstances connected to the JFK assassination. These include witnesses, people that worked in the government, gangsters, wow, all people from all walks of life. Folks who was at Dealey Plaza that day who took footage of the of the assassination, who took pictures, reporters, over 300-plus people have died who are connected to the Kennedy assassination case. Jay, uh, Judge Perry, who uh, Mr. Bowden saw a lot of when he was sending criminals to jail at a 100% success rate, this is the same judge who presided over the uh, Chairman Fred Hampton civil case. Uh, Chairman Fred Hampton was the leader of Black Panther Party, of Illinois, who was killed in his bed by Chicago police uh, on the orders of the FBI back in 69. He presided over his civil case and caused a lot of uh, mayhem in that case as well, which is why it took like over, almost 13 years for it to finally be resolved. Uh, and also, I mean, uh, some people in organized crime uh, was involved in framing up Brother Bowden as well. You know, people from the Chicago outfit, if you know anything about the JFK history, you know, people like Sam Giancana and Johnny Roselli are very well, very well known monsters out of Chicago outfit, the Capone mob, who worked with the CIA in trying to get, handle Castro. Because a lot of people don't know, or they, they know now, that Cuba was a hotbed for mafia activity. Uh, the gangsters controlled the casinos and the gambling and stuff down in Cuba. It was an open, you know, open town in Havana. And. Brother Bowden. I mean, is that, I mean, I, I did, uh, and also State Attorney Edward Hanrahan, who was a nemesis of the Black Panther Party of Illinois, 
was also involved in setting up Mr. Bolden. Is that correct, Mr. Bolden? Yes, that's right. He he was a state, he was a United States attorney, and he also was the uh, head of the uh, gang that went and assassinated Mark Clark and Fred Hampton. He that's right. Was the state's attorney at that particular time. It was like some people was in the mob, right? I mean, like uh, you, did you ever cross paths with a guy named Richard Kane? Do you remember yes. Richard Kane? Oh, yes, yes. Who was I, Richard Kane? Richard Kane, he, Richard Kane. he was a uh, sheriff of Cook County. And also he was a mafia member, right? He was a made man of the Yes, uh, yes. Office. And uh, he might have been an assassin connected to the Kennedy assassination case. Well, well that's I, what uh, Brother Walden uh, uh, says. And uh, I have no actual uh, proof of that, but uh, that's what uh, Walden, who, who wrote one of the books on the assassination, that, that's his theory. And uh, I, I can neither rebut nor confirm uh, his theory. But uh, Spagnoli was he a, a mafia type? I know he was. Oh yes, Spagnoli was tied in, uh, tied in with the mob. Yes, but Spagnoli did do one thing uh, uh, that that was right. He admitted that the that the whole case against me was a frame job, and that uh, the United States Attorney was behind it. And when the case came before the United States Court of Appeals, um, the uh, attorney who handled the case, Richard Seitz, was called before the uh, Court of Appeals when the argument was going on before the three-judge panel and asked point blank whether or not he had solicited perjury testimony in, in my conviction. And uh, Richard Seitz, in fact, the Court of Appeals judge, the chief judge, asked him three times, and Seitz refused to answer. His final answer was this: I refused to answer on the on the grounds that my answer may tend to incriminate me. He took the Fifth Amendment as to whether or not the government intentionally framed me for a crime, and they still sent me to the penitentiary. And I, I mean, because this is like this is very proud because I mean it was well known, like you said, you told the chief of the Secret Service that there were some issues in the professionalism and the uh, Secret Service agents following protocol, and after the Kennedy assassination. It was a real threat that the Secret Service was going to be disbanded or phased out, correct? Yes, that's right. That was the rumor. That's right. And they already knew that you already, you know, as on racket is going that the Secret Service had some issues. Yes, that's right. Absolutely. And uh, they didn't want, uh, they were very fearful that the uh, Secret Service was going to be phased out in the job given to the FBI. Okay, I just want to establish those. And Sister Margaret, you go ahead if you had a question. And we'll go to some other people on the phone lines as well. Uh, not really a question, just, well, I guess it is a question. How did you endure all of that that you went through at the hands of the government who employed you? Yeah. How did, I mean, I don't understand. Well, I went through, been through a whole lot, too. But, and I'm like you, it was God that brought me through. But uh, I, I know now why you endured it, how you endured it. But did you ever just were fearful for your life? Yes, sure, sure. I was fearful for my life. I, I certainly was. And uh, even after I was released from the penitentiary at the time, I was fearful for my life because I knew that they were watching me. I would, knew that my telephone was tapped and things like that. But I also knew that after I had, after what I had gone through, I, I realized that I was really under the protection of an almighty and that the things that had happened to me happened to me for a good purpose, and it was for me to discover what that purpose is, and to make it bring it into realization. Yeah, are you doing this I'll, too? Yes, I'll do. I'll go anywhere where people who want to uh, hear what I have to say. Yes, that's right. Yeah, I'll get your information from Ron because I want you to come down to Cleveland to Delta State University in September. Be glad to. Okay, that would I'll be put easy. it on my calendar. Anybody who wants to uh, to have me give a speech, just uh, they can contact me through my website www.echofromdealeyplaza.net. That's dealeyplaza d e a l e y. Yes, dot net. Plaza, P L A Z A. Oh, okay. Go to another caller. She's been patiently waiting. Waiting, uh, Sister Shane out of Memphis. Are you there? 
Sister Sheena, are you there? I'll let her come to the phone. Sister uh, she might not be on the phone. I mean, there's a lot of people listening. Uh, I know I'm getting a lot of great feedback in the chat room as well. And uh, I'd ask you, too, I mean, we talked about the Secret Service, like the improprieties on their part. But, you know, History Channel recently made a, a movie about the Kennedys that's came out, that has came out a, a lot of fire lately. Yes. Yeah. I want to ask you, you know, because you was in the detail, did you know some of the things that President Kennedy was doing in terms of extramarital affairs? Were you aware of, of that at the time? No, I was not aware. I was not aware of any, anything like that, you know. And, and as a matter of fact, um, uh, I, I was not really concerned with that. I really was not. Um, I, I didn't know, you, you know, uh, who the people that he was with were, and so I, I couldn't confirm any, anything concerning uh, the President Kennedy's specific conduct. All that I know is that uh, he, he seemed to be in high but He seemed to be a very good husband. He he played with the, his his children out there in uh, Little Caroline. And I'm just telling you, he was just a, a wonderful person to know. And uh, whether or not whether he had some something on the side or something like that, I I can't con- confirm anything like that. And if the agents were actually paying attention to what their real job is, which is which is uh, protecting the the, the uh, office of the presidency of the United States according to the Constitution of the United States, then they wouldn't know so much about it either. Well, that's yeah, exactly right. And is it true? Uh, I know you was in Dallas uh, when uh, Kennedy got assassinated, or the day before. But I, I read in certain articles and books that the Secret Service, you know, they was real, they were drinking and boozing and partying in the strip clubs, and somebody lost their badge. Is that true? Well, they that was a rumor that someone had to, may have lost their badge. I want to put that in the exact context because during the assassination of President Kennedy, a uh, deputy sheriff ran up the uh on, on the uh Dealey Plaza. Uh, he he ran towards the uh uh the picket fence there in, in Dealey Plaza because he thought that the shot had come from behind the uh, picket fence on the grassy no. And uh, the person behind who was standing behind there showed him a Secret Service identification card. And uh, it, it seemed to be authentic to this uh, officer. I believe the officer's name was Smith. But it seemed to be authentic. Now, when I made the charge, when I brought up the charge at the Secret Service, I was not in Dallas now. Mm-hmm. But I knew that their habit, how, how, how they were, how they went out at night, how they got drunk. And I made the charge that they probably had done this when they were down in Dallas. And um, so uh, they called me a liar at the particular time, you know, that I brought this up. But it was uh, subsequently uh, confirmed that they, in fact, went out. And uh, several of the agents who were uh, on the detail doing the assassination of the president stayed out until about 5 o'clock in the morning and went back on duty somewhere around 8 o'clock, which you can see uh, they, they are not prepared to protect the President of the United States uh, doing that kind of conduct. I got a, ch- a question from the chat room uh, from Elizabeth Witness. She's very insightful. She's been doing research on this for several years now. She wants uh, want me to ask you, should the Secret Service been on the back of the car during that phase of the parade, and why was the route approved? Yes, absolutely, they should have been on the back of the car. Now, the rumor surfaced after the president was assassinated that the president uh, didn't want agents on the back of his car, but that rumor didn't start until after the president was assassinated. Now, while I was in uh, Washington, D.C. in uh, June of 1961, the very car that uh, that the president was assassinated in uh, was was brand new. It was called SS 100X. Mm-hmm. That was the name. It was brand new. And one of the features that they uh, sent that car back to the uh, Ford Motor Company was because that the running boards were not long enough. The chief of the Secret Service at that particular time, U. E. Bauman and uh, James Rowley, who was the chief of the uh, Secret Service White House detail, 
uh, sent the card back in order to have those uh, running boards extended. So now, if there had been any question about the president wanting anyone to uh, uh, be behind him standing on the running boards, I doubt if they would have gone to that uh, particular trouble all the way back in 1961. No, that was just uh, uh, that. That was just um, you might say a CYA type of response by the Secret Service saying that the um, president didn't want anybody standing on a running board. The president never interfered with the Secret Service. And uh, Vince Palomaro, who is a Secret Service uh, a researcher, uh, can verify that fact, that uh, the very agents who claim now that the president gave that order told him uh, before the book was written on the president that, uh, that uh, the president never interfered with uh with, with uh, the protection. Oh wow I'm actually this too 'cause I heard a few said the reason why the president wasn't able to bend over and protect himself or shield himself was that he wore some type of back brace. I know he had a bad bad back. Yes, yes. He, he wore a uh, girdle or something like that. But, you know, yes, he had back. a back brace. He had a back brace. He 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 sure did. As a matter of fact, uh uh, I think he had it on on the day of the assassination. As a matter of fact, that, that it, it was in uh, introduced in evidence as some of the clothing that they took off of the president. Uh, but uh, I, I, I tell you, uh, I looked at that picture, which was mm-hmm. allegedly the back brace that they took off of the president of the United States. And I don't know why they would slip it off in in one piece. Usually they would cut something like that off, I would think. So it made me doubt whether or not that was his back brace or not. You you know, any emergency situation, Mm -hmm. they don't take time to unhook your belt and pull your pants down and unzip your fly and take your each side. They cut those things off. They just cut them off. They don't take time to uh, make sure that they're preserved in one piece. I thought I got a thing, uh, you know, thank God for the Internet. I mean, the Internet is so powerful. To me, it's the real fourth estate, and they're trying to shut it down for that reason. So like you said, we might not be having this conversation right now with us with the Internet. Uh, but I'd like to ask you, too, because I've seen footage on YouTube of Secret Service agents being told to stand down when you're just trying to, uh, I guess, go to the uh, Kennedy car. Yes, that's right. And now, was that like a uh, protocol? I mean, was that kind of superior to you? Oh, that 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 was that was way out of whack. That was way out of whack. Uh, when the Secret Service agent was doing his job, and uh, he was called back by uh, one of the supervisors in the follow-up car, and as a matter of fact, that agent was left at the airport, and. Uh, uh, it, it was way out of protocol for him to call him back like that. As a matter of fact, yeah. no agent should have been responding like the agent who was called back did because the car had slowed down less than 12 miles an hour. So, I mean, what you, what's your opinion about the whole thing? Was Did Lee Harvey Oswald act alone, or did he do it at all, in your opinion? Or was it like an inside job? Would you say it was an inside job? My opinion, uh, my, and this, this is solely my uh, opinion, right. is, is, is that that was a, a grand conspiracy to assassinate the president, and I think that the uh, Cuban uh, uh, faction had a lot to do with it. The southern faction had a lot to do with it. As a matter of fact, uh, in uh, Miami, uh, one one of the um, uh, proposed assassins was... Uh, was recorded in the telephone conversation, and uh, they were talking. We had an undercover agent who was a part of an organization, and um, there was a discussion that was monitored in uh, in uh, Miami, mm-hmm. in which they were saying, uh, what's the best way to kill the president of the United States? Now, this conversation uh, had occurred in November, the same month that the president was killed. And uh, the uh, reply was uh, to the informant that the best way to kill a president was from a tall building uh, with a rifle with a telescopic sight. And that's the way he was killed before the month was over. May I ask you, uh, oh, I'm just curious because, 
even when the Pope came to San Francisco, they had people checking all of the buildings, the tall buildings, mm-hmm. and taking out garage door openers and everything. They didn't have that kind of security in place. Well, uh, they were supposed to have that type of security in place. Of course, now uh, the the Secret Service at the, at that time was not the, like the Secret Service today. They have some over some two thousand men now. Uh, during that particular time, it was a small organization consisting of some yeah. 300 or something agents. It, it was very small. And we were worked up to the hilt. I mean, the agents uh, who were trying to do the job did a grand job with the with the number of agents uh, that, that we had. But it was those uh, few agents who were surrounding the president uh, who, who uh, you might say was making a uh, of breaking that chain of security around him. Those are the agents that were at me. But uh, basically it was a matter of uh, being stretched too thin and, and the agents, the conduct of the agents, uh, tended to, uh, to you might say, uh, detract from their responsibility to protect the President of the United States. I mean, there's some heavy stuff you're talking about here. I mean, this is... Uh Something that needs to be better known about. I, I just keep thinking, like, well, to pick back, pick it back out to what Sister Margaret said about. I had the chance to see Pope John Paul's last visit when he came to America. His last visit, Pope John Paul the second May, I believe back in uh, ninety eight, ninety nine. I think it was ninety eight, if I could recall. I was in college in, in St. Louis at Washington University, and he had his, you know, his Pope mobile. He had the bubble on top, the bulletproof bubble, and it's like he had real tight security. I mean, they real tight, and you know, everybody, you know, because you know he almost got killed. Uh, you know, so back in the, I guess early '80s, somebody tried to assassinate the Pope. But it just made me wonder about Kennedy because you look at the fact that he's going down the street with these tall buildings, and allegedly he said a joke. He said if somebody wanted to kill me today, it'll be a great day to get me killed. I mean, it was somebody said. You no, know, I was looking at one. Yes, people. that came also from one of the uh, Secret Service agents. Yes, and, you and, you know, a lot of things like were said. Mm-hmm. After the president was assassinated, that tended to put. Uh, the assassination of the president uh, at fault himself, and uh, trying to uh, make make it seem as, as if that uh, the president uh, had some culpability in his own assassination, which which uh, I don't find to be a believable uh, theory. Well, you, think, well, you know, they have always uh-huh. they always have a way of trying to blame the big victim when they think they're gonna get caught. So exactly. that's the standard American way, blame the victim. Especially a dead victim that can't tell no tales. Yeah. yeah that, that's right. <laughs> that, that's right. I want to get another caller, uh, area code 770 on the air. Welcome to We All Be Radio. 770, you can speak, 873. Everything to say? This is personal listening, 770. Yeah, I don't I just think it's, it's very interesting. I mean, I want to uh, get your opinion, too. Uh, you're a firearm expert. I mean, you served in the Secret Service, and, you know, you got, you're got you a policeman. you got a policeman background. In your opinion, did the shot come from the from the, from the the building, from the uh, school book depository building? I think some of the some shots were fired from the school book depository, from the information that we received, and I'm, I'm only going uh, by what uh, information that, that I know that the Secret Service uh, had, not by what any researchers are, uh, are saying. But I believe in, in by the Secret Service, uh, especially Agent Reedy, looking to his right and up, that uh, he probably heard something that came from his right-hand side which uh, he's standing on the uh, front running board of the uh, president's follow-up limousine. But I also think that uh, there was some firing uh, from the uh, front, the grassy knoll. And it is my opinion that uh, whoever was firing uh, uh, from the school book depository, whether it was Oswald or not, uh, may or may not have known that the person who was behind the picket fence was also firing. There, there were so many people who were uh, trying to get a chance to assassinate the president, and some of those organizations were not connected, and some were. 
So uh, there's a, a, a wow. chance that, uh, and I believe that uh, that there were simultaneously uh, shots that were fired at the same time, and and that tend to disguise the fact that two shots were fired instead of one shot. And so there are some researchers who are looking into that possibility now, uh, trying to uh, de- determine whether or not that might be a possibility in in uh, in uh, discovering just how many shots were fired at that time. May yeah, I ask you what uh, what did they do with this? You know, remember the, the photographer Sapruda, wasn't that his name? That yeah, took the film. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What what? Yeah. Whatever happened to those films? Did they destroy them or what? And then I want to ask you about Jack Ruby. Uh, was Jack well, Ruby connected with the mafia? Well, there is, there is some evidence that Jack Ruby was con- connected with the mafia. Of course, that's that's not surprising either, being that uh, Jack Ruby was running, uh, you you might say, a burlesque uh, uh, place, you know, where the uh, girls were uh, dancing and everything like that. Mm-hmm. Usually when you have a person in that type of occupation uh, where, where they own a burlesque club and things like that, there, there's a tie-in there. You can't hardly be in that type of business without having some tie-in with the mob. So also, you yeah. have a Chicago connection, too. Jack Ruby, he had a Chicago mob connection, too, correct? Yeah, yes. We investigated Jack Ruby here in Chicago, and he did have uh, some uh, Chicago connections with uh, uh, Sam DiStefano and uh, Gian Connors and those. Yes, he has connections here in Chicago, and that's been a, a, a proven fact. I mean, let me ask you this as a, as, as a pure conspiracy theory. Like, uh, they talk about the oil magnet, uh, H.L. Hunt, the meeting at his house the night before, the assassination. Is it strange to have, like, Richard Nixon and uh, Bush and Ed, J. Edgar Hoover and all these heavy hitters? Some of these folks had a well-known problem with Kennedy all in the town at the same time. Did this happen? Yes, I, I've heard. I, I've heard that. I've heard that now. So far as to why they were there, um, uh, uh, you, you know, for what purpose, uh, I, I really don't know. But it, it it strikes me as being a little bit suspicious. But uh, but uh, I don't have any firm evidence or. Uh, anything, uh, a knowledge of their uh, being at a specific place at a specific time, nor discussing anything that would be contrary to the Constitution of the United States. I don't have any knowledge of that at all. What about, uh, uh, what about the theory uh, about Lyndon B. Johnson's involvement in the assassination? Do you well, there, there, are several, that? there are several uh, theories concerning uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson. There has been... Uh, uh, a lot of research done uh, on that matter, and uh, uh, of course, I was not privy to any of those investigations that the FBI conducted, uh, or that the researchers uh, uh, conducted uh, concerning the connection there. Uh, I, actually, I, I, I tend to um, I'm, I'm trying to uh, stress uh, basically. What happened to me without straying too far out there in the in the, in the conspiracy uh, uh, theory? Because there are so many conspiracies out there, and I know for a fact that sometimes uh, what the government does is uh, put out pamphlets of disinformation, exactly. and, and they have you going off in a, on a wild goose chase, and then after a while you start to sound ridiculous or sound like you're a little bit touched, you know. (laughs) Yeah, 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 that's right. They put out disinformation, and they have people who write books uh, that that, uh, seem so uh, ridiculous and and so unreasonable as to make the whole research community look as if uh, their chain is slipping a little bit. Right. Yeah, did you read Mark Lane's book? Yeah, I'll go ask it, Mark Lane. Yes. Mark Lane is my attorney uh, oh. now, uh, in negotiations for in, in negotiations for a movie of of my book. He's my attorney, and uh, I also I'm in one of his uh, documentaries that's going to be released pretty soon. Now I think it'll be probably be released before summer, and uh, uh, he he and I we talk regularly and. Uh, 
He's doing some more investigation. He's going to release his documentary. As a matter of fact, a part of it is on the Internet now. If you look up Mark Lane, and then they'll, uh, they'll say Mark Lane interviews Abraham Bolden, and I'm on there also. So, Yeah, I mean, he was the first person to call the, into question the Warren Commission through his book, Rush to Judgment, right? Yes, yes, yeah. that's right. He did. Okay. He did. Mark Lane and, and, and I talked, we, we talked during um, a couple of times during his investigation of of this whole thing when he wrote uh, Rush to Judgment that, that uh, raised awareness of the inequities of the investigation that was done by the Warren Commission and by the Secret Service, and and I think that he sparked the other researchers in the action. Man, yeah, this, this is funny to me. It's strange, like Shakespearean, though. You had four people who became president that was connected to the Kennedy assassination. You know, Gerald Ford on the Warren Commission, you know, Richard Nixon and George Bush and Lyndon Baines Johnson. I mean, it's very Shakespearean when you think about who gained the benefit from the removal of the president. You know, because President Eisenhower warned us about the military industry complex. And if you know anything about American history, one of the greatest protesters of the military industry complex was none other than General Smedley Butler, the most decorated Marine in U.S. history, who said war was a racket. I mean, he's got a Congressional Medal of Honor twice. And this is back in the 30s, and, you know, he's telling people, like, hey, look, you know, I thought I was fighting for my country, but I found I was a mercenary for multinational corporations. And who really benefits from war? If you, you know, anybody ever listen or read the transcripts to Dr. Martin Luther King's uh, The Other America, when you spend more money blowing people up instead of trying to feed the poor and try to clothe the naked, uh, you end up with these type of problems. I look at even our our budget now. Fifty percent of that is Pentagon spending. You know, yeah. how can we do anything major in terms of social upliftment for our citizens? Like we always talk about what's going on overseas. We got folks in, in parts of this country that go to bed hungry. Yeah, we got a lot of fat people over here, but we got a lot of folks that are starving too. We got a yeah, lot of such right. mortality. We got a lot of miseducation going on. Mm-hmm. That's right. I mean, and they got a destructive that, pattern going on now where they're trying to incarcerate all of the young black men that they can, whether they deserve exactly. it or not. They even have exactly. a thing, just deal prisons around the reading scores of young black boys when they're in the fifth or sixth grade. How are you yeah. going to build a... Yeah, that, I mean, they don't specify that if a white boy can't read, he's going to prison. Mm. Yes, well, one one thing that the the public have to be in, enlightened as to many of these uh, uh, facts that that uh, you're discussing uh, right now, because after after all, uh, what they are doing and what they did in my case, and the the, the danger of not of the people not taking action in my case is this, is that uh, uh, the law works on precedent. Now right. we we have a judge that uh, told the jury in my case that I was guilty. Now that's a forty-seven year old president now, and mm-hmm. so now they can use that in the court system before the court of appeals, before the Supreme Court. Uh, many of the things that happened to me, they are setting a precedent. That's the reason that I can understand why more attorneys are not getting involved in my case and trying to get this thing overturned by uh, President Obama, uh, take some action on it, because as long as this thing festers, it, it, it becomes ingrained in the legal system. And uh, on down the road, now, say for instance, what I'm saying is this. There mm-hmm. was a, a young man who had some information uh, concerning um, uh, uh, the government, uh, some high government officials. He fled to Australia, and uh, they were trying to extradite this young man back to the United States of America to stand trial, say so he took some kind of documents with him when he fled to Australia. And he's fighting the, uh, uh, the extradition on the basis of what happened to me. Oh, and they, they're bringing up my case in Australia at, on grounds that he can't receive a fair trial in America. And and so that, that just tells you some uh, other nations are realize that uh, that president governs the, the, the whole laws that we go through. And so when they set a president for one black man, don't think that they're just looking at that one black man or one African-American or of, of one person, they're set presidents that they're going to go by until somebody stops them. 
and that's the danger in not taking action in my case. Yeah, I mean, I want to talk about your case because I just got I just got through reading a book about the uh, Max Charles Parker lynching that took place in Poplarville back in 1959 in Mississippi, and the way the judge conducted himself in your case and then Chairman Fred and Matt Clark's case, he could have he was no better than the judge in Mississippi. They told the grand jury, look, you know, you gotta you know, you gotta defend the white man's way of life, the you gotta protect white womanhood. So, you know, you know, it's like you know, like what Malcolm said, any place below Canada is Mississippi. Or well, mm-hmm. some other say, you know, it's, that's upper Mississippi, that's western Mississippi, eastern Mississippi. The whole nation is like a Mississippi mentality in terms of not trying to obey the laws when it comes to certain people or certain demographics. But I want to yeah. ask you this because uh, the time has been passed. I want to ask you a quick question. And I have been seeing, you know, like on MSNBC, you have these secret service men who wrote a book about their time uh, being spent in the White House detail uh, protecting the Kennedy family. And I kind of balance what you said in your book. And I, I want to know how have those guys, your colleagues, treated you since your time that you, you know, were framed and spent all that time in jail for something you didn't do? Had anybody reached out to you from the Secret Service community? There, there is a, no, nobody's reached out to me in the Secret Service community. They they haven't. As a matter of fact, uh, many of them still avoid me uh, like a plague. Mm. Uh, because they're still afraid. They, they're still afraid. I think that uh, one of the reasons that they treated me so harshly was to, was to set me up as an example for anybody else who wanted to open their mouth. They feel that, uh, well, what happened to Bolin might happen to me, so so they're going along with uh, uh, being uh, quiet, you know. And I don't, I don't think that many of the agents I work with could go through what I went through. I just don't believe that they could do it. What about the current Secret Service agents? I know some black Secret Service agents complain, agents complain about how they were treated during the Al Gore campaign. And I'm yeah. saying some of them filed a lawsuit. Has any one of those guys reached out to you? The Jack and no. Ron, some of them all. No, no, none, none wow. of them have reached out. One of them uh, tried to contact me, and then all of a sudden I, I didn't hear anything else uh, uh, from him. Uh, but uh, there are 57 of those agents uh, uh, who filed a suit against the uh, Secret Service for prejudice. And the same thing that uh, that was happening to me back in 1961, they were complaining about just just eight years ago. There were hangman nooses uh, uh, being hung over their desk and over their doors, uh, and there were certain uh, remarks that were being made. They were not being promoted in accordance with their ability, mm-hmm. and that suit, as a matter of fact, is still ping- pending right now. That's amazing, man. Just, but it's like like you said, we don't have a fall through. Well, after you said the president, and I don't care if probably know your story. Mm-hmm. And you guys are supposed to think uh, in your business knowledge is is is, is, a, is a invaluable asset. Yes, that's right. For and knowledge itself, and like you said, a lot of the brothers, I mean, a lot of people they use to try to control you and destroy you were people that look like you. Yes, that's and right. In the same background. That's right. You know, Whatever a lot of people's to. opinion is this: is that uh, that uh, they they don't believe that. Um, that uh, the same thing can happen to them until they exactly. hear the handcuffs clicking, and then they <laughs> say, "Hey, the same thing is happening yeah. to me now." They got me now. Everybody, come on, let's uh, let's do something about this. <laughs> this is I was going to ask you. Yeah, I was going to ask whatever happened to the guy that falsely accused. You? Well, that yeah, falsely accused you, the yeah. convict that uh-huh. was arrested. Frank Jones uh, uh, drank himself to death, and I, I don't know what happened to uh, Joseph Spagnoli. I do know that uh, one of the other guys that uh, that uh, uh, well testified in my trial committed suicide up in uh, Michigan, and uh, he had a little house up there in Michigan and blew his own brains out. But uh, there's just some strange things happen, you know, but... Uh, People just have to do that which is right, good, and, and just, and uh, that which will create love and bring brotherhood to one another. And as long as a person does that, then he's wearing a, on the arm of God, and it's, it's very difficult to bring a man like that down. Well, it's just like, uh, I know, I mean, you're a renaissance man. I, 
I mean, you from East St. Louis, and you know, a lot of times people tend to look down on East St. Louis, uh, not knowing the history of that great, you know, town. And you actually uh, are an accomplished trumpet player. You was a music instructor after you got out of Lincoln University, correct? Yes, that's right. And you also went to school with Miles Davis? And Miles yes, Davis? that's right. Well, my brother went to school with Miles Davis. Okay. Yeah, my, it was my oldest brother uh, was in the band with Miles Davis, and what I would do, I would go to my older brother's band practice and, and help him carry his bass on the band practice and hang around there watching those guys uh, when they practice. Uh, and that's how I happened to meet Miles Davis. He was about uh, five, six years ahead of me. Okay. Yeah. Well, was, was he impressive? I mean, did you see, well, he, no, did you know that this guy will become what he became? No, nobody ever suspected that. <laughs> nobody ever suspected that. Uh, as a matter of fact, they thought he was a little weird. Uh, he would jazz up all of the marches that uh, that they would be practicing, and he would take off, I'm telling you, and uh, you just couldn't understand. You could tell it was the same march that they were practicing, but he would jazz it up so much, you know, that everybody thought he was a little bit weird. And all of a sudden, this guy goes to Juilliard School of Music, and, and who's in Broadway except Miles Davis? I said, son of a gun. <laughs> I mean, when y'all to, like Eddie Randall, right? That was the teacher for y'all. I mean, that's Normandy High School y'all went to? Well, yeah, yeah, that's right, Lincoln High School. Lincoln, okay. Yeah. And uh, Eddie Randall was the instructor. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, Elvin, Elvin Buchanan. Oh, well, Buchanan. Eddie Elvin Randall was, was the instructor. Okay, Edward okay, Elvin Buchanan. He was your instructor, too, right? Yes, that's right. Okay, cool. I mean, that's, uh, some history needs to be known. But I just like to you, I just want to give you honor for your service, like I said. I mean, you still standing, brother. Over 300 people ain't talking no more. They ain't walking the earth. They ain't telling their side of the story. And somehow God has seen fit to see you through the storm to tell us, to warn us of what's coming down the road. And I also want to ask you this because it's very important to me. What happened in Arizona, Tucson? I mean, I'm just amazed that a guy could do that much destruction without anybody, you know, stopping him. I mean, what's your opinion about that, that tragedy? What could have prevented that tragedy, if anything? Well, there's it, it, no question that, uh, in, in my opinion, that the young man needed uh, needed some mental help. Uh, it's no question about that. But I think that the climate that was created uh, during the election and uh, some of the things that were said uh, that kind of encourage that type of action. And uh, you take a fickle mind and, and you continue to um, bombard it with uh, suggestions of violence, and, and, and that fickle mind will carry it out, uh, whether it's in the conscious or subconscious state. That, that's the way I see it. I mean, you think the climate, cause, like the climate is kind of similar to the climate of, of when you were serving during the Kennedy time, right? I mean, it is dreadfully alike. It, it, it is so much alike that it, it, sometimes it scares me. It's it's exactly like uh, the climate that was that we had before, just prior to the assassination of President Kennedy. You have that uh, same division. We have a division of uh, what to do in Afghanistan and and, and Iraq, and we also have. Uh, Problems with the uh, economy. We have racial problems, and and uh, persons shouldn't fool themselves. These uh, problems that we're having right now are very serious, and they're very explosive. And it, it's going to take a, a lot of patience, a lot of love, a lot of understanding to solve these problems. That's the only way we're going to get through. And you are a true unsung American hero. What can we do, the American public, to help you get justice in terms of you getting a full pardon from the president? What has been done so far, and what should we do? I think uh, that the, the 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 most important thing that a that, uh, person could help me do is help me get my case before the public. And once that we do that, it, as many appearances as I can make on the college campuses, uh, in the churches, in the schools, uh, I, I'm available. If, if we can uh, arrange to have me on the speaking uh, tour, then I think that we could generate enough um, uh, uh, interest in my case to have some action taken by the President of the United States. And I think 
that if uh, if this president doesn't take action, I don't think action will be taken un- until I'm deceased. But I, I think right now what I need is exposure. What I need is exposure on on shows uh, like yours, like CNN, MSNBC, and uh, uh, stations like that, where I can get my case before the people so that they'll understand the crucial issues that are involved in my case. And uh, that needs to be put forth before the general public. So if anyone wants uh, uh, to uh, to uh, schedule me for a talk or speech or anything, contact me through my website. And as I said, that's www.echofromdvplaza.net. And uh, I need to go on to speaking to, I would like to hit all of the uh, black college campuses and and uh, many of your uh, major institutions uh, like churches, uh, like uh, organizations, uh, uh, like fraternities, and 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 things like that. You understand? I, that's that's what I need exposure. Well, brother Abraham Bowden, exposure is what you shall get. And on behalf of we all be and uh, all these grateful listeners and future listeners of this podcast, we want to thank you for your invaluable service and for your invaluable wisdom and your example of what it means to stand for something. Because if you don't stand for anything, like Brother Malcolm said, you'll fall for anything. If you don't stand yes. for something, you'll fall for anything. And truth crushed to the ground shall rise again. And you are a living testimony of that of that brother. You are a beautiful person. And in the words of the great Duke we love you madly, brother. Thank and you very much. Going sir. Thank you. It's been really eye-opening and eye-opening for me, and I am looking forward to trying to get you down to our, our annual conference at Delta State. Thank it's you. sponsored by Florida State University. So maybe you know, yeah. that'll connect to Florida State, too. I mean, yeah, Florida, the University of Florida, not Florida State. Yes, so I, I'm looking I have forward to trying teaches. to see if, where? I have a son who teaches in Tallahassee. He's a professor in Tallahassee, Florida, Florida oh. A&M University. Yeah. Oh, that's great. It's a beautiful thing. Oh, All yeah. right, everybody, yeah. Sister Margaret, thank you so much for yeah, uh, all being a two trooper and caller. I definitely will, Sister Margaret. Okay. And y'all all take right. care. Have a great night. Thanks. All right.